Hello and welcome back. In this podcast, I'm going to cover orogenic wedge theory, or in its more specialized form, what's referred to as critical wedge theory or critical Coulomb wedge theory. But before I get started in the more technical aspects, let's start with uh, this question of what exactly is an orogenic wedge? Well, we've already seen several of these. You saw very uh, quickly with the structure of a subduction zone, what we refer to as the accretionary prism or the accretionary wedge. This is this wedge-shaped uh, block of upper crustal material that is highly deformed. Uh, it, in fact, it's deformed into the shape of a wedge. And this is exactly the, the process that we'd like to get into today. How do we form this sort of a, uh, of a crustal structure? Uh, in closer, View. We saw also this slide already in which we again identified the accretionary wedge as being this wedge-shaped uh, block of deformed crustal material. In this case, it's mostly formed by material sediment that is uh, brought in on the subducting plate and is then accreted through a series of thrust vaults, which are what you're seeing here, into thrust sheets or blocks that are then incorporated and deformed into this uh, accretionary wedge-shaped body. Uh, we've also seen this picture of the Alps. This is a cross-section of the Alps. There are many similar pictures, but what all of these pictures will have in common is that they're showing that the deformed orogenic belt has a wedge shape. It's thicker in the back, it's thinner in the front, and it's made up of slices of crustal material that have been taken off of the downgoing plate and accreted or deformed and attached to the upper plate in order to form this deformed wedge, uh, what I would call rather than an accretionary wedge, an orogenic wedge, the difference being merely that in this case, there are slices even of the basement of the upper crust uh, or the upper of the downgoing plate uh, they cut down through the basement into the upper crust or even deeper into the, uh, into the lithosphere. So all of these uh, zones, if you'd like, have in common their wedge form and the fact that they are uh, formed by material that's scraped off of the downgoing plate. And the analogy is often used of a pile of sand or snow even in front of a bulldozer that if you are pushing from the back and, and piling up a, uh, a big pile of snow or sand, it will deform and it'll deform itself into a, the shape of a wedge, thicker in the back and thinner in the front. And the reason for this is, uh, is, is because of the mechanics and the internal strength of the material that in fact make it easier to slide across the surface, in this case, the surface of the earth, like a street, uh, if it has this shape of a wedge. And in fact, it's this sort of shape and this sort of deformation that we see in, in places like the Eura, this is the Appalachian fold and thrust belt. We see exactly this sort of, this pattern of deformation and this overall shape of the deformed body. This idea is not terribly new. It goes back to some of the first work that was done in the Alps. This argument was uh, made for the formation of thrust faults or overthrusts. Uh, where, which were of course studied well in the Alps. This is going back to the 1890s, looking at an analog experiment in which a, a kind of bulldozer or you know a, a, something that is able to push on a layered pile of sand will deform it and form these these thrust sheets or thrust faults and uh, a deformed wedge. And of course, this is already at this time recognized as being analogous to the kinds of structures that we would see in the Alps. A more modern version of that uh, same process is shown here. This is a little movie of a deforming uh, wedge, orogenic wedge that's being formed uh, by a little apparatus like this, which rather than uh, sort of pushing the back where this is now pulling the material on a plastic sheet that's taken up on a, on a wheel, that, that sheet goes underneath a layer of sand, pulling that sand then into the, uh, uh, into the deforming zone. And what you can see then is that this original flat line colored sand is uh, progressively deformed, an entire whole series of uh, thrust faults that form. They form first in the back and then they propagate out towards the front, but they stack up and thicken themselves up into, uh, into a wedge form. 
this particular model is a little bit atypical in that it also is simulating erosion by uh, sort of sucking material off of the top. This is being cleared off through the uh, uh, progression of this model, which is of course made by time-lapse photography. So you don't see the person coming in with the shovel and taking the sand off, but you can see that the deeper parts of this uh, orogenic wedge are being exposed by erosion. The idea being that this in, in fact demonstrates other features of mountain belts like the Alps, like the fact that we can see high, say high pressure metamorphic uh, naps or sheets that, that uh, have been exhumed by erosion further back into the, uh, into the pile. But that doesn't change the overall uh, pattern of deformation that we see. Here's, a, here's a, an example of another analog model with sand layers being deformed into a wedge, but in this case without surface erosion. And what you can see then is the time sequence going from top to bottom, deformation starts, we have one thrust sheet, then we have a second thrust fault, a third thrust fault, and so on. And we build up this stack that ends up with this uh, uh, wedge shape to it. And what we call then the taper, a taper angle between the, which is, represents the angle between the surface of the wedge and the surface of the base of the wedge. This is a relatively simple example where the, uh, the base is horizontal and flat, so it doesn't play much of a role. And we have a taper angle to this wedge then that is, is given by the, the angle of the surface slope with horizontal. As I say, this is exactly what we see in mountain belts. This is, a, this is now not an experiment, but an actual cross section of a mountain belt on the bottom. So this G is, a, is the actual uh, modern day structural cross section of this thrust belt. This one I think is in Taiwan. Uh, but if we take this series of thrusts and try to reconstruct those, and this is a you know, common exercise with this sort of a system, we go back through this time sequence F, E, D, C, B, A in order to arrive at the original stratigraphy of this section, which is in fact flat line, relatively uniform stratigraphy. And if you do this exercise correctly, you can see that you have a sequence of thrusts that are going in time from one to eight in this case, and building up this, uh, uh, this stack or this wedge, this deformed wedge, uh, which is a, a type of fold and thrust belt and it's forming in the exact same sequence as those sorts of uh, analog models with the sandbox that I was just showing you do. So this is a interesting kind of a model or, or, or reference to uh, try to understand both the sequence of thrusting, but also the overall structure of an orogenic belt or an accretionary wedge. And so it's received quite a bit of attention also looking then at the mechanics of this process. You know, what does it tell us about things like the state of stress within, uh, uh, within this, this uh, deforming or, uh, orogenic system? So there's been, as I say, quite a bit of theory done on this, both uh, numerical models and analytical models and analytical theory. And I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of this. It's in a little more detail than we often do, but uh, in part because I, I find it's a nice success story as to how one can use uh, really you know, mechanical analysis, stress, strain, deformational models in order to make uh, some interesting predictions as to the, uh, the structure and the sequence of, of, a, of a mountain belt. And it also gives some implications as to how internal deformation of a mountain belt responds to different kinds of forcing, which, which again, I find quite useful. So we're gonna take a little bit of time and try to go through this. But again, we'll start with a very simple uh, conceptual model. How is it that this uh, kind of a system works then? Again, if we take our little bulldozer analog, this is what we call some is the backstop of a mountain belt or a wedge. We have then layered uh, sediment or rocks, or you could even be crustal material that might start out with some uh, initial thickness. We have a dipping decolmont. This could be the top of an oceanic slab, or it could be like the European crust that's under thrusting the Alps. But, it, but it's in general dipping down underneath the mountain belt. And we, we're gonna assign, this is a beta if you can't read that, we're gonna assign this variable beta to, be, to represent now the, uh, the dip angle of the uh, downgoing plate. Uh, as this bulldozer advances then, uh, goes forward, it will then be, begin to build up a, uh, a wedge. The steepness of this wedge then is going to depend on the mechanical strength of the material, as we're going to see. The size of the wedge is going to depend on how much mass is added into that wedge. So with increasing time, 
we're going to see a larger wedge, but it isn't necessarily going to change its geometry. And in this case, we're going to characterize the geometry by two angles, the angle of the decolmont, which I already gave you beta, and the angle of the surface, which is we're going to call alpha, right? And this is uh, maybe drawn wrong and that this should be drawn, that should be a horizontal line. This is, this is measured off of the horizontal. I can't tell if that's drawn correctly or not. But alpha is the angle of the surface with respect to horizontal. Beta is the uh, angle of the, uh, of the basal that they call not relative to horizontal. As I say, the geometry doesn't necessarily change in that the size of the wedge gets larger with time. If we go from here to here, it's getting larger, but the angles we're going to now, in fact, argue stay constant. And so this is what an example we call self-similar growth. The two triangles that define this wedge are the same shape. The angles are the same. Those are called similar triangles. It'll get bigger with time, but it will not change that geometry. So it's an example of self-similar growth of a wedge. All right, the next, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause for a second because I have a problem with uh, my graphics once again. Okay, I'm back because I had a failure of my slide here, but uh, where was I? So let's go uh, back to the, wedge theory here uh, and talk about one other important aspect of that, and that is the rheology. How is it that these uh, kinds of wedges deform? There's different ways we could treat that, but the one that uh, I'm going to focus on is brittle deformation of the wedge. And the reason for this is that that seems to be dominantly what we see in these uh, shallow structures. We're in a relatively surficial deformational regime, low temperature, large stresses, pretty high strain rates, uh, lots of brittle faulting. And so we're going to assume uh, that we're dealing with brittle rocks. Now brittle rocks uh, in their simplest form will follow a kind of friction law, such as what I'm showing here, which is labeled the Coulomb failure criteria. But this is a kind of friction law where it says that the, the shear stress is proportional to a normal stress. The proportionality is a, uh, a kind of friction coefficient, which we'll call mu. Uh, and if there is a inherent cohesion or strength to the rock with no normal stress, that's what we refer to here as S naught. So that's the cohesion. Uh, so if the normal stress is zero, then the rock still has some shear resistance. If it's non-cohesive, that means that this term is zero and it has no shear strength unless there is a normal stress. And then there is a coefficient of friction that determines how easily it can then slide on a failure plane. So this is a, a law for sliding on a plane. That plane in the earth is a fault and that fault could be oriented at any given direction, uh, at which point this becomes representative of the rheology of a continuum. That is, if we have faults at all possible slip orientations, the one that will slip will be the one that uh, that provide that slips under the minimum shear stress for a given normal stress. So there's an orientation dependence here that comes into this. There's one other uh, aspect of this that often becomes important, and that is if we have fluids present. So if there's internal fluids, as in uh, saturated porous media fluids, then we have an internal fluid pressure to that material, and that internal fluid pressure lowers the effective stress of the deformation. So we have to have a fluid pressure term that is, in fact, subtracted then from the normal stress. And this, uh, of course, is quite important in things like submarine accretionary wedges, where the fluid pressures can be quite large. So that will come back into the problem. Okay, so here's our theory. And this uh, looks a little complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through and I want you to try to understand what this equation is at least trying to do or what it is uh, saying, even if you don't go through all of the, the math. But what we'd like to do here is we'd like to do a force balance. Very simple, like a mass balance, we're gonna do a force balance. We're just gonna look at, at the forces that are acting on a column of rock. So this is our column of rock right here. Uh, if we orient our axes, our x and z axes like this, then the, then the column of rock is going in the z direction. Uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be tilted with this angle beta, which is again, the tilt of the, uh, uh, the basal detachment to, to, of our wedge, what's sitting underneath our bulldozer here. Uh, 
So again, like I did before, we're going to define a beta and an alpha for the geometry. There's some surface slope and there's some uh, basal slope. And we're going to assume that those are constant. You can see little waves and there might be changes in alpha, might be changes in beta, but we're just going to assume that those are constant for this analysis. There is then what we call the taper angle, which is the alpha plus beta, right? That's the taper angle of the whole wedge. So we want to balance the forces that are acting on this column of rock. And this is a typical sort of analysis. And I'm not going to tell you where that column of rock is. It could be here, 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 here. And in fact, you better get the same answer no matter where it is. So it's a very general analysis of, of the problem. So what forces are acting on this? Well, uh, the simplest is gravity. If this uh, has some kind of a density, it's going to have gravity. And that gravity is going to be acting in the downward direction. That's this vector g. Uh, it has scrap that vector can be decomposed into two components, one in the z direction and one in the x direction. What we're going to do here is just worry about the forces in the x direction, all right? The z direction that's basically rock pressure, it doesn't matter too much. So, we're just going to take the uh, uh, components in the x direction. So, what is gravity? Gravity acting downward is going to be rho g h which is this term here, h is the total thickness. The weight of this material is rho g h, like it always is, right? Uh, we could put in a little uh, delta x for the width of this if we wanted a true mass, but I'm gonna, this would be x and x and plus dx. We could put that in, but it just kind of cancels out everywhere. So I'm gonna ignore the dx, but I'm gonna take rho g h as gravity. And because I'm only going to worry about the horizontal direction, I have to multiply that by a sine beta. That sine beta comes from this component here. We're going to take that component and not that component, right? So this is the part of gravity that's acting in the x direction. And if you can think of, if you can see that right away. If you think about the this being flat, the beta would go to zero, sine beta would go to zero, and this whole term would disappear. So if this were in fact horizontal, there'd be no gravity force in the x direction. If it's tilted, there is, and that factor becomes sine sine theta. The next force we have acting on this column is the is the water, or it's not, it's not even so much the the water as it is the fact that this is a sloping surface, and because this is a sloping surface, that's going to generate a difference in the force here and here, right? From from this end of the column to this end, because this is dipping, there's going to be a, a, a difference in the pressure of the water. And that difference is going to be given by, uh, first of all, here's a row water GD. D is now the water depth. So that's the weight of the water, but it's going to be different from here to here uh, with the difference being determined by the sine of alpha plus beta. If you're really, really interested, you can figure that out. Uh, but it is really just the difference in height from here to here. And that will turn out to be a, a term that looks like that, all right? The next term that's acting on this is uh, what we're going to leave a little bit undefined for the moment, but we're going to just call that tau b, which is the shear stress that's operating on the base of this column right here. Okay, so this is now the frictional force, if you'd like. It's some kind of a shear stress that's acting on the base of the wedge because there's an underlying plate that's moving. I'm not going to define it quite yet. We'll come back to that, but we'll just say, okay, there is a shear stress along here. And then the last and most complicated one is that there is then a uh, force that's acting on the edge of this column right here. And, and, uh, and, that, and that's countered partially, not entirely, but partially by a, a force that's acting on this side, right? So we have these two restraining forces uh, on each side, which we'll call, which again, we won't quite define, but I'll just say, Right, if there is a sigma x, which is the stress in the horizontal direction, the x direction, not horizontal, x direction acting here, and there's a, another sigma x here without defining them yet, what is the net force on here? Well, the net force on here is going to be this one minus that one divided by the distance between them. And that is, in fact, a derivative. That's the d dx of sigma x. And then we have to then uh, integrate that force from the bottom up to the top, again, over this uh, H here. So this is essentially saying we're going to take the difference in the force and we're going to integrate that. You can do those in any order. So we do it like this. We're going to integrate that force in the, in the uh, vertical direction and take the derivative of that force in the X direction, right? And that gives us the net force. So the, the mass balance says that these four forces have to sum to zero. And I'm 
can then take that. So this is our this is our statement of mass balance, of force balance, and I can make that simpler by writing it like this. And if you know something about geometry, you can see what I, what I've done here. I have uh, gotten rid of all the signs, and I've taken the sine of beta and just turned it into a beta. How do I do that? That's uh, what's called the small angle approximation. It says that uh, if the angles are small, that includes both alpha and beta here, then the sine of the angle is approximated by the angle itself. And uh, if you don't believe me, get out your calculator and take the sine of one degree. You gotta do it in radians, I suppose, but take one or two or three or four degrees, take the sine and you'll get the, uh, you'll actually get your, the same angle back again. All right, so that makes it a little bit simpler. And I'll come back to that in a moment because that's gonna now say, well, okay, I'm gonna be able to, to get rid of a lot of the trigonometry and keep that in a simpler form. All right, I'm gonna uh, kind of step aside a little bit and talk about the fluid pressures a little bit because again, it's important to, uh, to keep these fluid pressures in here. And I'm going to simplify this problem a little bit by, by talking about, not about fluid pressures, but about pressure ratios. And uh, the reason we're gonna have to do this is because I'm gonna have to start talking about the vertical stresses in a moment. And so what I'd like to do is actually calculate the vertical stress in the earth. What is the vertical stress in the earth? Well, it's particularly underwater. If we take a case like this, where we've got a, a, a pressure, uh, or maybe we take this one is actually the, the best. The, the pressure, this is gonna be the, the Vertical stress sigma z is going to be equivalent to the weight of the material above it. And what that means is that if we're up in the course in the water column or the, or the pressure, if you'd like, at the bottom of the ocean, it's going to be rho w g d, where d is the water depth, right? And then as we go further into the earth, we're going to get an extra term, which is this rho g h minus z or z. This is, the, this is simply saying that we're going to go down. Uh, Okay, again, keeping in mind that the H is just the thickness, but we're going to go into the earth. So Z is defined from the bottom of the wedge. But the deeper we go in the earth, the higher the stress is going to be. And that's what we call then the lithostatic pressure. It starts from here and then it goes at this uh, gradient here because rho in general is larger than rho W, right? So we go down this line and then down that line. And that's the lithostatic pressure underwater. So the problem is that the uh, hydrostatic pressure is the fluid pressure of uh, water that's in the pore spaces of the sediment inside of our wedge here. That's going to continue to increase uh, at the hydrostatic pressure gradient, which is this rho w g depth, right, along like this. And so in fact, the effective pressure that the rock feels is uh, going to be this lithostatic minus the hydrostatic. Right, and if there is excess fluid pressure in the system, that is, you know, due to say compaction of the sediment or something that is causing the fluid pressure to increase above this hydrostatic pressure gradient, that fluid pressure could in fact come up to this point here. It can never increase past the lithostatic pressure. If it does, that's what we call hydrofracking. The fluid pressure is larger than the lithostatic pressure, the rock is gonna fail. So the fluid pressure will always be somewhere between this pressure line and this pressure line. And the effective stress, what's important to, to uh, uh, say rock deformation is then the difference between this lithostatic and the fluid pressure here. So the way that we can write that in a, in a relatively simple way is we can define this ratio between these, these uh, between lines, that is these lithostatic pressure lines, and just talk about a fluid pressure ratio as being the ratio between something that's going along this line and something that's going along that line as, as lambda. And lambda will, will then be always less than one, but it will be uh, uh, somehow a, a something between about 0.4 and one and express then how overpressured the fluids are. If we, if we do that, then we can talk about the, the normal stress then in terms of this fluid pressure as being not just this, uh, this term with the rho gh minus z, but in fact, this one minus lambda term, which is, is now giving us then uh, the state of overpressure of the fluid. Okay, why do I wanna know that? Well, now here comes the next part, which is the rheology. All right, we wanna bring in this Coulomb yield stress. So the vertical stress, is going to be what dominates the normal stresses on any failure plane. And we'd like to know something then about the shear stresses needed for this to fail. 
So in fact, we can write uh, immediately the, so I, the, the shear stress on the base of our wedge in terms of the normal stress. And the normal stress is going to be this, this term here, this one minus lambda B rho G H. Okay, that's the, the fluid pressure adjusted weight of the sediment. And I'm gonna now add in a uh, coefficient of friction, which is this mu B. The B means that this is the coefficient of friction along the detachment, along the, the base of the wedge here. That's gonna be different from the coefficient of friction for the internal part of the wedge, which will deform according to a different friction coefficient, which is mu. So I've just introduced two physical properties, one for the sediment, mu, and one for the base of the system, which is mu b. Sometimes we write these in terms of what's called the angle of friction. All right, so this is a coefficient of friction, but we can also write this as a different uh, parameter, which is exactly expressing the same physics, but we give it, call it an angle, and we call this coefficient of friction the tangent of the angle of friction, which is this phi b or phi, right? And these phi b's and phi's are gonna come in, so there's a jump back and forth a little bit, but these are equivalent, right? You just go back and forth between them here. All right, so if you go back to uh, back a couple of slides and look at the, the expression that we had for our force balance that had a, a shear stress along the base. And where this is now important is that we can now rewrite that shear stress in terms of this coefficient of friction and the normal stress, which is much easier to calculate because it's just rho GH, right? If you know the density and the fluid pressure and the height, you know what, and the coefficient of friction, then you can predict then the shear stress. All right, so there we can plug that in for the for the tangent uh, term, tan p tan sorry, the shear stress term tau b here. Uh, what about the interior part? Well, for the interior, remember the again go back two slides and you'll find this this term that we had this integral of the sigma x. So sigma x being the horizontal force, we need to integrate that over the uh, over the h, the height of the wedge. What we can do is we can write this in terms of the vertical stress and the Coulomb yield stress. So if we simply say that the, that the X term here is related then to the vertical term, the sigma Z, which we can write in terms of the pressure. So here again is the, the water term and then the rock term. And then we get this kind of complicated thing with the you know, cosecant, secant terms and so on. This is uh, looks complicated, but what it really is just saying is friction holds. And there's a normal stress and there's a shear stress. And this is a way of getting at that, that shear stress. And if this is true, then we have a, that, what that allows us to do is simply replace all the stresses with their Coulomb failure equivalents. Right, and there's a this all reduces down to one rather ridiculously complicated parameter, but which is called k, and this is simply to account for the angle of the stress, but it can be written entirely in terms of uh, what we now have as uh, our new physical parameters, this phi b and the phi, and that's all you've got on this side. It's just the uh, coefficients of friction. Right, so this is just a very complicated way of writing down a friction law, normal and, and shear stresses, but it's done uh, at kind of an arbitrary orientation. And what that lets us do then is, uh, is, is take these uh, uh, force balance expression. So we had the force balance, we combine it with this Coulomb yield criteria and we put them all together and we can write one expression that is in terms of the, gives the geometry, the alpha plus the beta, that's the geometry again, right? These are just our, our angles. And we can write that then in terms of the physical properties of the wedge. The densities, uh, which actually are minor, the fluid pressures, which are important, and the friction coefficient, which is also important. Remember the K is also a function then of the uh, physical properties. Right. This one is this is actually a simpler version because we remember that we've made this the small angle approximation here. But what it's uh, maybe it's better if I just show you sort of an answer. This is then what we call the critical wedge equation, and again, it's just expressing then the physical 
characteristics of our material and the, the final geometry. What does it do then? It says, well, it says that alpha plus beta, okay, there's another beta over here, but the first order, the alpha plus beta, that is the taper angle is going to be some uh, function of, of all of these physical properties. One of the first things or simplest things we can do is go back to these little sandbox experiments that I was showing you and uh, ask the question then, how does it, uh, how, do, how do, well does it predict the, the answer? Well, in fact, the sandbox found that there was a, a linear relationship between the surface slope and the basal slope. And so if there's a linear expression like this, then that, in fact, is that's what this is. It's the equation of a line. Uh, it says that that slope should somehow be a function of the coefficients of friction of, of the material. And again, maybe it's easier if we just look at, uh, at some analog model results. Here are three wedges that are made in a sandbox all right, and uh, something has changed between these three experiments. So A, B, and C represent not time, but three separate experiments, and something has changed. So what is that something? Well, uh, that something is the physical properties of the material, all right? How do we know they've changed? Well, the alpha is different. So this is a large alpha, right? So it's a steep wedge, so the beta is uh, zero, for all three of these models, but the alphas change. This one is steep, medium steep, relatively flat. So there's a small alpha. So we're seeing a, an increase in alpha as we go uh, up in these pictures. What has been changed here, I can give it away, is that it is the coefficient of friction of the basal material. So the top one was probably run on a very sticky material like a sandpaper. And the bottom one was run on a very slippery material, like a mylar, a very slippery plastic sheet. And so the coefficient of friction on the base is here large and here it's small. And maybe we can even see that, uh, uh, well, you'd have to kind of work through it, but this is the coefficient of friction on the base. This is a sandbox experiment. So the lambda is zero, that falls out. We don't even have to think about that one, but the basal coefficient of friction is here. And alpha plus beta is going to be proportional to, to all of this, but it's gonna be linearly proportional to the friction on the base. So a larger coefficient of friction on the base means that that taper angle should be larger. That's what we're seeing up here. Large coefficient of friction on the base, larger angle, all right? That's the basic principle that, uh, that lies behind the, the coupling between the physical strength of the material and the coefficient of friction on that basal detachment and the geometry of the wedge. Okay, all right. Historically, that what I just showed you was a, a fundamental paper in the early 80s, a pretty, pretty powerful paper. It gave a lot of interesting ideas. Within a couple of years, it was realized that maybe it was more complicated than it needed to be. And then in fact, it was, as long as you made the assumption that the, the material was non-cohesive, it was actually possible to solve this much uh, in a much simpler form. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of, of that. And, and again, it's here for historical reasons. But again, with this uh, assumption of a Coulomb wedge, but now it has to be non-cohesive. And what this paper showed then was that in fact, if this was the case, we had non-cohesive material, you could solve this problem very simply just by looking at the stress orientation. And the reason for this is, be, is because uh, you have to have failure along the basal detachment. So this is a, a failure system. Uh, and, and you have to have a state of zero shear stress along the upper surface of the wedge. Because, why? Because it's, it's got water on top of it or air that it cannot maintain any shear stresses if it has a, a liquid on top of it. So this is a zero shear stress surface. And this one, we know exactly what the shear stress is because it's sliding along the, the base. It's at its failure criteria. And that means that the stresses within this wedge have to be oriented in one direction and only one direction. Again, this is part of the self-similarity argument that we don't know how big this wedge is, and we don't have to know how big this wedge is. This wedge here could be any size you want. The stresses will always be oriented in one direction. And if you know that, you can actually solve for that orientation. And I won't go through it, but you can solve for that. And uh, 
you, you find that in fact, you can predict not only the, the geometry of a wedge for a given set of strength parameters, but you can also predict the angles of the fault planes that would be in a homogeneous material if it were to fail under that state of stress. So you've probably seen like Andersonian fault theory that tells you, you know, which way normal faults go or thrust faults and so on. This is the same thing. This is just saying that if you have one orientation of the stresses, Andersonian fault theory, by the way, predicts is based on the assumption that the stress, one stress, one principal stress is horizontal. In a wedge, that's not true. In a wedge, the, the stresses are oriented uh, at kind of an arbitrary angle, the principal stresses. And so the failure planes are at a sort of a, an arbitrary angle. And you can in fact calculate and predict then, let's, let's just look down here for a moment because most accretionary wedges have a very small a uh, small angle, a small taper angle, and a relatively low dip on the, on the surface. Under those conditions, you get thrust faults in these two directions, and you, but you can predict exactly uh, uh, what those would be. If in fact it gets too steep, if you're dipping down at 45 degrees, you'll find that in fact there's a set of normal faults and a set of thrust faults that are complementary because the stresses are oriented bisecting these angles of the failure planes, right? Something so they would be going. I know it's hard to see how I'm pointing, but along a line like this, right? We can. It turns out we can calculate that for a, for all kinds of geometries. Any any geometry that uh, you could think of, you can then calculate the orientation of the stresses and the orientation of the faults. All right, but but in fact, for uh, for real accretionary wedges, we're mostly looking at things with surface. We're looking down in this corner of space, if you'd like. We're looking at basal dips of under 10 or 20 degrees, surface slopes of under 10 or even 20 degrees. But again, there's a, a, a complete set of solutions for solving for things like this. In this case, this is dry, a dry sand wedge. Okay, so no fluid pressure, lambda, lambda, b are zero. Uh, there's no cohesion, cohesion is also zero. And what you find is that, in fact, there are uh, a set of solutions for any given, you know, think of it as, well, let's, let's do it this way. For any given phi, which is the angle of friction of the sand for internal faulting, and phi b, which is the uh, angle of friction for the base, if you specify those two, you can then calculate what this uh, alpha and beta is. With one complication, there's two solutions for every uh, set of physical parameters. And that's what these, this uh, set of curves is. So for example, if I have a uh, internal, which way is this going? This is for phi B of uh, 20, this is for a phi of 30 degrees. Everything here is for phi of 30 degrees. So that's the internal angle of friction uh, and different coefficient of friction on the base, phi B. So for phi B of 20 degrees and a phi of 30 degrees, this is what I expect the relationship between alpha and beta to be. Except that there's another curve over here, which is 20 degrees. And that that's, follows this curve along like this. So in fact, if I had a basal dip of 10 degrees, I would have a solution right here with a surface slope of two degrees, but I'd have another solution up here with a surface slope of 28 degrees. How can you have two solutions for one set of physical proper, properties? Well, this is the solution for a wedge that is undergoing compression, contraction, and thrust faulting. And if I go up here to 28 degrees, this is a wedge that's in fact collapsing in extension. So here it's going to be a set of normal faults. 28 degrees is really steep, right? You'll never see a mountain belt with a regional slope of 28 degrees. You can see a hill slope that gets that steep for maybe a few hundred meters, and then it's too steep. It collapses as a landslide. And that's what this essentially is telling us, that there is a set of of uh, wedges, of failing wedges that are, are essentially collapsing under their own weight and they would be failing under normal stresses. So we don't really care very much about what's going on up here. If we're looking at fold and thrust belts, we're worried about the solutions down in here, okay? But even so, it's, it's sort of interesting to, to recognize that the, the theoretical existence of these kinds of failure states. And in particular, in fact, I'm going to come back to this in just a moment and, and talk a little bit about what that implies for uh, geometry of orogenic wedges that are, that are in different states. So again, here's a solution. This is a solution space for one set of physical parameters. This is the phi of 30 degrees and a phi b of 10 degrees. Uh, 
right? And so here again are the two sets of solutions for a given uh, basal dip angle of beta. This is the surface uh, slope angle alpha. And we have these two solutions and, and the one like say marked here on five would be a compressional failure. This would be an extensional failure. And these are sort of mapping out also domains of uh, different kind, different states of stress in a wedge. This is this is uh, so this is kind of compression or failure on this boundary in here, and this is sort of extensional collapse in these in these boundaries two and three. We can also sort of think look then at, at what happens to this uh, these sets of solutions as the physical properties change. So again, changing the basal friction, this phi b. Uh, if the, again, the phi is 30 degrees, I, I should mention that a wedge will only exist if the basal detachment is weaker than the material interior to the wedge, right? And that sort of makes sense. If you think about if the, if the base were stronger than the wedge itself, you know, you forced it to, to, to slide and fail, what would happen to the material in, in the, of the base? It wouldn't slip on the base, it would simply jump in one millimeter into the interior and fail on a new plane inside that weaker material. So this only kind of makes sense if the phi B is smaller than the phi, which means that the detachment is weaker than the material inside. So the phi B is always less than, than phi, but we could look at a family of solutions and in particular, we could look at what happens as phi B starts to get very close to phi. That's this 29.9 degrees, for example. What happens is this domain uh, between the two solutions collapses down to something approaching zero. We have almost one solution then that's, that's uh, simply following you know, this very tight, uh, tightly constrained domain here. The difference is very large, like if the phi B goes to zero, and that, yeah, that is possible, it can go to zero, then, uh, then you'd have a very broad domain with the contractional failure along this line and the extensional failure along this line, okay? So what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, these kinds of solutions and these kinds of domains also tell us something about uh, how an orogenic wedge will deform. And in particular, if we, if we think about this uh, in terms of a, say, a mountain belt or an accretionary wedge that is maybe in a transient state, it's not necessarily uh, uh, in a full critical state, uh, it, it tells us something about how the deformation has to, has to uh, sort of propagate through the system. And I'm going to show you that by, with, a, with a couple of little kind of cartoon examples. Uh, I'm going to show you this in, with a, with a uh, little cartoon wedge. This is, this is my wedge. Uh, this is a doubly virgin wedge in that it also has a wedge on the back because the material is getting pushed over the back, which I'm going to talk about a little later, but not right now. So we can kind of ignore this side. All right, so this, you think of this as the backstop or this could be, a, as I say, a back thrusting wedge, but it's, it's not too important. What's important is that the material is, uh, is being forced by subduction into the wedge and it's gonna build uh, an accretionary wedge here. Now, uh, one more point that maybe I haven't made very clearly uh, is that there is an assumption here that this material is at its failure stress. And uh, that is that you know, we're having slip on faults, which means that the shear stress has exceeded the failure stress or the slip stress and it is deforming. But that's not always true, right? I mean, it can be that, that, that rocks are not deforming, right? Uh, and in fact, that could be true in different parts of space that they're not deforming. And in fact, what I'm gonna try to show in these cartoons is, is zones of non-deforming and deforming material as, as yellow and blue respectively. And the simplest one to think about is this blue zone out front. What's this? This, this continues off to the left. These are our flat line sediments that are being pushed into the, into the accretionary wedge and are going to be forced to deform. Before they encounter their first thrust fault, these are not deforming. And this, that means that the shear stress in this zone is less than the uh, critical stress needed for failure on those planes. Similarly, our decolmant, the detachment, if we know that term, decolmont, that's the detachment, the basal detachment underneath the wedge here. Uh, this, we're again assuming that it's a failure for a critical wedge solution. That means that it's slipping, but it's not always slipping. If we go out here, it's not slipping, right? It's not sliding underneath the uh, uh, flatline sediments. And the reason where what that implies then is that the shear stress 
along that surface is less than the failure stress, all right? So I'm showing that as blue and the red as being the part that's, that's slipping, all right? So we have uh, two things to think about always in these cases. First, is the wedge sliding on its detachment? And second, is the wedge deforming internally? And, and this becomes important because this is really now we're talking about where deformation localizes in an accretionary wedge. All right, well, let's, let's uh, think about this for a moment in terms of uh, wedge taper. So again, I'm gonna look at this space and let's just say that these are the uh, solutions that correspond to the material properties of this wedge, surface slope, detachment slope, alpha, beta. We have this uh, solution for the, for the critical wedge. Uh, let's think a moment about what's going on out of the front of the wedge here though. In particular, this uh, undeformed sediment, undeformed rock, non-sliding detachment, this is what we'd refer to as a subcritical state. Okay, first of all, the surface slope is, in this case, it's zero, right? Or it's at least, it's at least less than critical. So it's somewhere sitting down in, in, in this corner, if you'd like, uh, depending again on the, the decolement, but the surface slope is going to be less than the critical taper slope, right? Critical taper slope is given by this line here. If we're out in the front, that alpha surface slope is less than the critical taper slope. So we're gonna be sitting in this space somewhere here. Maybe we'd be at zero and zero would be a point right there. But it's somewhere in this field that's labeled subcritical. Now what happens, uh, and, all, and the detachment's also not slipping, right? So it's not sliding, it's not deforming yet. Uh, nothing happens when you're in here in this subcritical corner of this uh, critical wedge diagram. All right, what happens as this rock gets pulled into the wedge? Well, what happens is it's gonna get thrust. There's gonna be a, a thrust forming here. What's that thrust going to do? Well, it's going to, it's going to deform uh, the rock and it's going to actually uplift parts of it and it's going to steepen the surface slope, All right? So the beta won't change but the uh, surface will steepen. So a rock that started here will move to the right and it will start to, to experience an increase in the slope. That means that it's going to move up along following this green arrow. It doesn't matter where you start, start here, go up and it's gonna start steepening <clears throat> towards this uh, minimum critical taper line, All right? This in fact is, this is a kind of uh, feedback if you'd like that, that says, okay, anything that's not steep enough is going to get steepened by thrusting and deformation until it reaches this minimum critical taper line. All right, and that's exactly the process then that, that, that goes towards building this critical tapered uh, uh, wedge, right? Okay, uh, and in fact, all else, if we didn't do anything else to this system, that's exactly what we do. We'd bring material in the front, it would steepen it up. This, this is our snow plow, if you'd like then. We're gonna build our snow plow wedge out in front by steepening it until it hits this, this point. At that point, it's gonna stay at that uh, taper angle or that surface slope angle and grow self-similarly. But there's another uh, kind of state that one can get into. Uh, it, depending on transience and the deformation, it could be that, that a wedge becomes too steep. So what happens to a, a wedge that is now, that is like this, for example, it's now the surface slope is now larger than the critical slope. It's too steep for its critical taper angle. What that means then is that we could, we could draw the physical state of this wedge as a point that's gonna sit above this minimum, minimum critical taper line, could sit anywhere up in, in this region up here. This is what we refer to as the stable field. And what does that mean? That means that now uh, this, because this part of the wedge is steeper than it should be to be critical, that means that the normal stresses are actually larger than they should be for critical failure. And in fact, this is a, this is a wedge that is actually too strong to deform internally. All the internal deformation shuts down. It's referred to then as, as stable. We don't see any deformation in there. Okay, well, that's, that's sort of interesting, right? It, it, it doesn't collapse, right? You think, oh, it gets too steep. It's gonna collapse in extension. No, no, it won't collapse in, in extension until you make it this steep all the way up to here. If you're somewhere in the middle here, that simply means it doesn't deform at all. Now, what it can do is it can continue to slide on its base, sliding on base, deforming only on edge. 
this, if it's strong internally, it's very happy to slide along this detachment. The detachment is weak. It's a zone of weakness. It will slide. There'll be complete rigid blocks on both sides. Maybe you have earthquakes. You have, certainly have slip along here, but you simply have no deformation. So what, uh, what does that imply for, uh, for, for deformation then? Well, it implies then that this material here is going to continue to push into the wedge. There's going to be deformation of the yellow zone, but no deformation of the blue zone. What's that going to do for the surface slope? Well, what it's going to do is it means that this stuff is going to back thrust up on top of the blue. If the blue is not deforming, but the yellow is, you can still get a thrust that's going to bring material back and on top of the blue zone. What does that do for the surface slope? It lowers it. So if we were starting, right, if we keep piling up more and more material here by back thrusting, this angle is going to go down lower and lower. And that means that a, a state that was up in here is going to move down in this space. Beta stays constant, surface slope goes down, it's going to move down, and, and again, it's going to approach this minimum critical taper solution. So in fact, this uh, uh, Minimum critical taper is a kind of a tractor, if you'd like. It's the stable state of, of two negative feedbacks. If a wedge is not steep enough, it will get steeper until it lands on this curve. If a wedge is too steep, it's stable, it will get less steep until it lands on this curve. So everything, all deformation is driving the state to this minimum critical taper. And this is why we see these in nature. This is why the snow in front of a snowplow is at one angle, because any deviations have this negative feedback that are going to perturb it and drive it back to this uh, uh, critical condition where everything is deforming internally, but we have exactly the right angle to keep things deforming internally while still sliding along their base. All right. Okay. Let's start looking at some of the geological complications. And I'm going to come back to this idea of stable, stable wedges and unstable wedges again, because that, that can drive a lot of different ideas and structural styles that we see in, in, in mountain belts. But let's go back to the a little more of the geological geophysical observations. First of all, what's a bulldozer in nature? Where do we really have bulldozers like this in nature? Well, in fact, we don't, not very often, certainly not in mountain belts. What we tend to have is we tend to have uh, some kind of a boundary between an undeforming, uh, say, volcanic arc or a continent. This would be the, the marine accretionary wedge setting, deforming sediment. Remember, we have this old four arc basin sitting back here. What's that doing back there? Well, it's kind of trapped, that's kind of ponded sediments that are sitting between this undeforming basement and this deforming accretionary wedge. They just sort of get trapped between the two. But the bulldozer is something that at most is a very gently dipping surface of this basement that's coming down underneath the four arc high. And there are many, there are complications to this, but there are lots of uh, systems in the, in the oceanic world, in particular active margins, where you can track this uh, backstop or bulldozer as it dips just a few degrees and terminates somewhere near the outer arc high of the Grecianary wedge, right? So this uh, sort of suggests that, well, we, instead of talking about a, a, a vertical wall driving all this, we should be thinking about something more like a, a flat line backstop. So we put it back in our sandbox experiment and think about, okay, we're going to pile up our accretionary wedge, but we're going to let that wedge back thrust over the top of our backstop and, and form what's in fact a second wedge, if you'd like, or a different deforming zone uh, that, that's back thrust on the back, uh, on the back side like this. So here's a little analog model. This one kind of runs a little bit slow. So I could talk for a while. You could watch it or I'll leave it or you can speed up the YouTube if you get bored. But here's, uh, here's the result of, the, of, of this experiment, right? So you can see now that the, you're still forming an accretionary wedge out here. It's still deforming. It's still building up this critical taper. There's a nice critical taper angle or alpha right there. But it's also back thrusting on top of the uh, upper plate sediments here. They may be uh, deformed, they may not. There's a zone in here that's uh, completely undeformed that has to do with the angle of this, this back thrust. But the material in here uh, is, is again deforming. However, the angle that's, that's here on this, if this is a wedge, this angle here is, is much, much steeper than the alpha that we would predict from here, right? 
And this is uh, consistently backed up. Here's the here's a uh, set of cartoon analog interpretations of that same kind of a model showing the pattern of thrust that we get in this kind of an experiment. And what we find at the end of the experiment is we have a nice secretionary wedge out here with the nice predicted alpha here. But on the back, we have maybe a little uh, kind of accretionary wedge that's here, but we have a much uh, thicker and steeper wedge that's, that's, up, that's uh, up here. And in fact, that's, uh, here's another example of that. This is kind of universally observed. We have this uh, frontal wedge out here that fits our critical wedge theory and this overly steepened wedge uh, back, back here in the back. Right. And we, the, the, the terminology we sometimes use for this is we call this the pro wedge or the pro side and the retro wedge, or this is the zone of retro sherriage in the Alps, the back thrusting zone or the, or the back thrusting wedge on, on the inboard or the landward side of the system. And the, the interpretation of this, I give you sort of the quick interpretation is that, is that uh, uh, this wedge is in fact not critical. Okay, and in fact, if we, uh, I'm gonna show you one more slide and then I'm gonna back up for just a moment and show the critical wedge figure again. Uh, here is the, uh, again, the wedge taper uh, for one of these model runs, just looking at time along this axis. So it's in fact showing that the, that the uh, we have these two solutions, minimum taper, minimum critical taper solution. In this case, it's like seven degrees. We have the maximum critical taper, which is up here around 30 degrees, in this case, 32, 30 degrees, 32 degrees near the angle of repose of the material. Uh, but the, the pro wedge, the one that's dipping towards the incoming plate, uh, with convergence, it goes to, in fact, our analytical solution. This is our theoretical minimum critical taper solution. It does that very well. The back wedge, the retro wedge, steepens with, and in fact, it steepens with time, but it does finally reach some kind of a value, which in fact is neither the minimum nor the maximum, it's somewhere in the middle here, but it's certainly well uh, above this, this critical taper angle. And the argument for this, I'm gonna have to run back to this figure again, is that, uh, so the pro wedge, and here's a doubly virgin wedge even, so here's the retro wedge, it's sitting way up here somewhere, in its taper angle, the, the, the pro wedge is sitting exactly where it should down here in the minimum taper angle. Why, what is it that, why is it sitting up here, the retro wedge? It's because it's not critical. Uh, why is it not critical? Well, what is it that I was saying drives the, the this wedge into, into its critical state? It's, it's these feedbacks. If it's down here, it's subcrit, it's the feedbacks that are driven by the accretion process. If it's subcritical and we accrete new material, that forces thrusting in the toe that steepens the wedge. If it's back here and it's too steep, there's back thrusting that's going to lower the taper angle. That back thrusting is driven by accretion of new material coming in here. So this accretion, which is really subduction driven, right? Subduction driven crustal accretion is important to drive the deformation that keeps that wedge critical, either through frontal accretion or back thrusting. When we jump over to this side into the retro wedge, there is no accretion. Or if there is, there's very little because this wedge is growing out into the, say it's foreland on this side, it's, it's propagating in this way. There might be a little bit of accretion here, but for the most part, there's no frontal accretion. There might be back thrusting from behind, but that's not accretion. That's simply piling up material on the, on the top of this wedge. The frontal accretion and all these thrusts and so on, they just aren't occurring back here. So there aren't these feedback mechanisms to take a wedge that's sitting up here too steep. And in fact, it's probably too steep because you've got all this back thrusting of material back here, right? There's nothing to drive it down to the uh, minimum critical taper. So it's just gonna hang out in this overly steep state for quite a long time. And I, and I'll, and I just, I'll, I'll show you that one more time on this figure. This material was back thrust over the top. It's just not deforming anymore. It's just a kind of a rigid block of material that's been back thrust here where it's pushing into the foreland. There is accretion out in here. We go back to the critical wedge mechanics and that's this thin taper angle on the, on the front of, of the retro wedge. So accretion, the point here is that the accretion of new material through shortening and thrust faulting 
forces the deformation, the deformation forces it onto that critical wedge taper angle. Okay, thanks very much. I'll send you some more information by email, but that's it for this lecture. Thanks again.